welcome to the DTC Insider Podcast, where online business owners come to find actionable tips and tactics to grow their businesses. Now, here's your host, Brian Roizental. Hey, welcome to another episode of the DTC Insider Podcast. I'm Brian Brayson, your host, and today I'm going to interview Adam Robinson. He's a founder and CEO of Retention.com, a company that helps Shopify merchants turn anonymous shoppers into revenue. How cool is, how cool is that? Brands like Warby Parker, True Classic, and Dr. Squash see up to 50x ROI with their solutions that help grow email lists and abandon cart revenues. Hey, Adam, thanks for being on the show. It's a pleasure to have you here. Hello, hello. Yeah. And by the way, before getting started, I wanted to give a shout out to Mariah Parsons at Malomo for making the intro. So thank you, Mariah. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, For those who um, don't know about retention.com or have never tested it, could you please tell them more about it, what it's about, and what it can do for them? Absolutely. We have two flagship products. Number one, for a Shopify store, if someone comes to your website, they do not fill out a form and they leave, we can get an email address for that person on let's say a third of your traffic why is that amazing because only two or three percent of people fill out your pop-up form so it's like 10 times more email addresses who doesn't want that especially into black friday yeah it leads to a bunch of questions which you're going to ask me yeah i mean it sounds like magic already sorry i wanted to say yeah second one yeah 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 and then the second product um there's a couple major problems with how abandoned cart flows operate right now or function in the world. And this goes for abandoned product, abandoned cart, and abandoned checkout, um, which if you're very advanced in email marketing, you have all three of those set up. So the problem is that those emails can only be sent out if someone is authenticated or logged into your store. Either they made a purchase recently or they actually logged in or they filled out an email submission form or they clicked on an email or something very recently. That's a very low percentage of people who are putting stuff in their cart. Call it 20%. What's making this dynamic even worse is Apple keeps ratcheting down on third-party apps' ability to track people in their ecosystem. Six months ago, Facebook and Klaviyo could track somebody on Safari for two years. Now it is seven days. So if someone's anonymous, they can't be sent an abandonment flow. So if you can imagine the size of the audience of people when it's two years versus seven days, it's just a lot smaller when it's seven days. So our identity technology, the same thing that allows us to capture email addresses of people that don't fill out forms, we can help you continue to track and identify several orders of magnitude larger of audiences for these flows. And that product is called Reclaim. So yeah, that is what we do. That's awesome. And it sounds like magic, but can you explain quickly how how it works for the audience to understand where you get the email addresses from? I don't know, people some have, you know, uh, fears where they are just skeptical uh, so about the the solutions they don't know about or how they work. So it would be great if you. Yeah. So let's do the big three. How is it legal? How does it work? What do I send? <laughs> how is it legal? Let's start there. So this is a U.S. only technology. Can't do it in Europe. Can't do it in Canada. Only U.S. What is not widely understood is that in the U.S., The Can Spam Act of 2003, which was reviewed in 2019, says that email marketing is opt out. They say nothing about opt in. They say you must, to be compliant with Can Spam, it must have a functioning opt out link in the email that actually unsubscribes people when they say, take me off of this. But there is nothing in that law that says anything about it being opt in. The next question people have is well, what about this CCPA thing? 
Like I thought it was just like GDPR. That's what I've been hearing. It's very similar to GDPR with one key difference. Unlike GDPR, there is a federal level opt-out email law in the US, which does not exist in Europe. If the states came in, which they would like to, and say said emails opt in, they would get sued under federal law. So a critical difference between GDPR and CCPA is that it's an opt-out legislation and it is not, does it? If you are CCPA compliant already, using our technology does not make you not compliant. Using our technology does not implicitly make you compliant. You would need, and a critical piece of information about this, which is very important is, most people definitely don't know this. This California state law only applies to you if you have over 25 million of revenue. Which I don't know who's the listener of this. Maybe some of them are bigger, but like probably most of them are smaller. My guess is people who are sitting here listening to Econ podcasts are trying to get it moving. <laughs> you know? Awesome. So um we we cover a lot of it on what retention.com is, how it works. But you know, talking about the the e-commerce space, we and not only the e-commerce space, like brands, advertisers have received a lot of hits in the last few years after the iOS 14 update and now the iOS 17 update, which is not as popular as the iOS 14 update for a reason, right? But how do you think that that affects e-commerce um, brands specifically? The updates? How, how, how it hurts them? Yeah. So iOS 14 was all about basically if the user said so it stopped allowing facebook to track where that user went if facebook didn't know where that user went facebook didn't have the ability to include them in a retargeting audience everyone's retargeting audiences became way less effective retargeting is the most effective ad you can serve the end of that was it ended up costing 50 percent more to acquire customers for most people just because they took away that really critical part of Facebook's ability to see what you were doing on other websites, right? Um, iOS 17, the thing that's relevant to us is this, tr is, is tracking in Safari and, and prohibiting these pixels. Just, it, it, wipes, it wipes people's cookies clean after seven days, different deal. But it's less popular because I think it's it's does it's not talked about as much because it's it's not quite as severe. And there was so much pain with iOS 14 that like a bleeding is still continuing, but people are kind of learning how to play the game differently. And they're not it, this wasn't a scenario where it's just like, oh my, you know, this just like was a huge pound of flesh taken out. What I think a lot of e-commerce stores don't realize is that if they solved this problem, you know, it would help both their meta ads and you know it would it would help them receive more events into meta which would then allow meta to serve better ads and then the audiences in clavio would be much larger too so um so yeah that look the net effect of anything that apple does that makes tracking harder is that advertising will be less effective because tracking is what leads to better targeting so you know, unfortunately, the trend is just going to continue. They're going to try to make it harder and harder. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about it. It's kind of a bummer. It's like there was this beautiful world when Facebook created this beautiful machine that could track everybody and knew your deepest desires and exactly. So it, it enabled these incredibly niche products to get off the ground that could be sold into quite small audiences. Yeah. that's disappearing as well. You know, the brands that are killing it now, right? It's like true classic is this, they're the fastest growing Shopify store. They can run a very amusing ad to men, you know, and then they get people on the website and instead of buying one shirt for $24, they get them to buy 15 shirts for like $200. Right. And it's just this amazing, it's this amazing bootstrapped machine that, so you know, 
I think it makes some things harder, but if you're, but with every closed door, like another one opens, right? Like th yeah. those guys yeah. probably wouldn't have been able to grow their business so fast pre iOS 14 because the ad inventory was going to these much more niche plays who could afford to pay way more for this exact person. Right. Yeah. Um, anyway, things are always changing, right? Like, yeah, and, and I think that's a good thing. I mean, of course, it's easy to say that we need to embrace change, but of course, in practice, it's hard, especially when it hits your company pretty hard, as it did for, for many advertisers. But um, we, I had uh, John Loomer on this podcast in January this year, and we are, as we speak, in October, right? So it's been a few months, like a month, right? And especially then... We didn't know how this year was going to be like, you know, but we talked about the fact that, as you said, previously people were, or advertisers were able to filter through the audiences and now they need to filter through the message. And even if it's getting harder, it's getting harder for everyone. Now, most companies target broader audiences were broader, way broader than before. It's not the, like the, the hidden audiences that everyone wants to unlock and the secret ones that, that we need to find uh, to, to win. But it's more about the message. It's more about the marketing and leveraging tools like retention.com and many others to try to, uh, to, 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 to be different and to uh, uh, expand uh, the reach of our message. So talking about the iOS 17 update, um, is there any way that retention can help, uh, maybe through Clavio or any other way to solve this problem? Uh, well, that is what the second product that I described does. It literally, instead of being a third-party Clavio tracking pixel that activates Clavio, we lay down first-party cookies for brands, which aren't getting blocked, right? Like, you can't really mess with a first party cookie laid down through the Shopify ecosystem without starting to break people's websites. So um, yeah, I mean, we make these Clavio flows great again, right? Like they're, they're just right back to where they were before. Um, and this is a niche that I love being in because I feel like it's, you know, my interpretation of what Apple doesn't like is what you know, using data from other websites to serve ads on a different website. I don't think that they're necessarily trying to impair a brand's ability to like follow its own traffic. To, you know what I mean? Like, I think that that's how they want the internet to work actually. So it's like, it's kind of, you know, like, like we said before, one, one, one door closes, another door opens. Like, I love being in this market because the problem is so real. People can understand it. It's like, oh yeah, seven days sucks. Like, and it's okay. Well, this is what we're going to do for the next 10 years. Like they're going to ratchet it down. And then we're going to just keep inventing solutions that help brands track so that they can serve so that they can deliver, you know, timely, personalized, relevant messages, right? Like, if you can't track, you can't do that, you know? Yeah. It sucks. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, Black Friday is around the corner. Do you have any advice for uh, merchants to be better prepared for that time of the year with regards to the email marketing, of course? Yeah. I mean, I would say do what Dr. Squatch did. Use our product called Grow. Grow your email list as much as you possibly can and try to sell to those people on Black Friday. <laughs> they used, they they onboarded our tech um, 90 days before Black Friday itself. And during the whole holiday period, we were 5% of their total revenue. They made a million dollars in October. They paid us 20 grand. And it was just a great thing. And, and it's 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 growing their email list through people who visited their site and didn't fill out a form and then just 
retargeting them with newsletters. That's as simple as it is. And you have to be very diligent about unsubscribing people who don't open the first couple of emails. But those who do engage, they behave just like your opt-ins. It's amazing. And you, you mentioned Dr. Squash. Is there any um, minimum company size that um, I don't know, uh, sh that is um, that should use your product or is your product? So, so yeah, here's the thing. If you don't have web traffic, we can't resolve your web traffic into emails, right? Yes. If you're not good at email marketing, meaning you're not making money from your email, then buying more email addresses to send emails to that are even colder than the ones that you can't make money off of, that's not a strategy you should pursue, right? So, and if you don't have an existing email list of 20, 30, 40,000 contacts, this strategy just tends to not work very well. Because what's happening is we're mixing cold emails in with really, really hot emails on a much larger size. And that's why it all works. If you, the thing is, the people who want this product the worst are the people who are just starting off. But if you only send to these emails, it'll just break it because it'll be too many complaints and like whatever else. So I have found the magic number is like kind of a two to three million in revenue where this balance is correct. And but there are some other variables. It's like if you are if you have a small list or you send very infrequently, then it doesn't work as well. Bigger the better, but like starting at a couple million below that, it's not really going to be worth your time. It's, you know, figure out how to get your acquisition metrics dialed in more, get that revenue up, you know? Um, yeah. So that's, that's kind of the, the threshold. That's awesome. And now talking, talking, um, about the, the company, but, um, I know you, you like building in public. I follow you on LinkedIn and I advise everyone listening or watching these to follow you too. Uh, you post great content there. Uh, so thank you first. And second, uh, what are some of the top lessons that you learned while in this company? Because it was a, and it is currently a wild ride, right? Uh, you, boost, you bootstrap the company and now it's like um, 20 million in annual recurring revenue in under four years, right? Yes. So you, I, I guess you learned a lot of things. So could you please mention if you, if you can, of course, some of the top lessons learned? Yeah. So this is my second startup. The first one did not get to 20 million in revenue in four years. The first one got to 3 million in revenue in four years. And um, probably the most fundamental lessons I learned from that one, because I think before you start, like, I think some first time, a, a lot of first time entrepreneurs who are really successful, they kind of did something related. They, they developed skills in their prior life that made them successful as a first time entrepreneur. I was a credit default swap trader before I did this. I worked on Wall Street in Manhattan. It had nothing, literally nothing to do with this. So, um, you know, when you start something for, from scratch and you know nothing about it in this world that we live in, it is long, it is hard, it is terrible. You learn lessons the hard way. Um, so depending on where people are in their journey, the lessons that you learn, for instance, from 10 million to 20 million are very different lessons than you learn from zero to 1 million. Zero to 1 million is harder, for sure. There's no question. Zero to one is always the hardest. When, if someone speaks to me who's starting their first company and has not even started yet, I have nothing to say to them because ideas, like talking about ideas, is it is not a good indicator of whether something's going to work or not, right? If someone has successfully exited their first company and is talking to me about an idea, all of a sudden it's much more interesting because they know what it takes to actually get something off the ground. Somebody who's never gotten anything off the ground, I tell them if it's software, I say, go read this book called The Four Steps to the Epiphany. And you are not going to be able to do this. I wasn't, but 
spend as little money as possible and raise as little money as possible until you are absolutely certain that you have something close to product market fit, which you also need to research to figure out what it is. Um, I have been, I, it became, in, my last company was stuck. It was clear to me that the product market fit was not good enough. And I switched my entire orientation towards striving towards creating something that had true product market fit. That, this company had that, you know, like people immediately wanted this after you described what it was and they bought it and took us a while to find the ideal customer profile. So like our, businesses churn was a little bit high for the first couple of years, but um, it has a very good product market fit. Our B2B product, I think will have even better product market fit. Now, my intuition on being able to say things like this, I think has gotten much stronger over the last 10 years. My ability, even I was an expert in nothing, but like I would hear an idea and it would sound great. Like now I have no opinion on most people's ideas outside of my area of expertise within this very narrow realm of like email marketing, identity, you know, sort of like sales, like whatever. My intuition, I think has gotten pretty good. So um, yeah, my two lessons for people who haven't started are read that book and try to follow it as closely as possible and spend as little money and don't raise money if you, if you, if you can. And if you have to do as little as possible because most people fail because they run out of money at the end of the day. There's a million reasons why they run out of money, but it's because they stop because the money didn't work for them in some way. Um, and if you can just stay in the game long enough, which is very hard emotionally, <laughs> but if you can just stay in the game long enough, you're like accruing lotto tickets, right? Like you're kind of, the idea would be that the dream scenario, which I managed to create for myself without even kind of knowing it, was I had this cash flowing vehicle that was paying for my life and my employees and stuff. And there was like this cash flow coming off of it that was kind of like this slush fund that I was experimenting with. Made three experiments three years in a row. Two of them failed. One of them worked. Spun it out. That's this company. I'm currently doing the same thing. It's like this company got it to 20 million AR. It's going to grow steadily, you know, 40, 50% a year for the next few years. That's awesome. I'm not going to say it's an autopilot. There's a lot of work being done, but like, I'm not doing it. So um, we think that there's an even bigger opportunity to sell into these B2B software companies, a similar identity product, but instead of it being email based, it's based on the LinkedIn profile. And we're resolving LinkedIn profiles, which then you can go to, business email and phone number and title and company and everything else. And we can get like almost half people's US web traffic and just hand it to the sales team, right? Which is with page view history also, which is different than this core product, which is unbelievably valuable. So the lessons that I have learned from zero to one apply now again to this new thing, which is like, you know, try to get something off the ground using as little, as few resources as humanly possible. As efficient as you can, zero to 1 million, as efficient as you can possibly make it, do it. And then when it appears that people, the product market fit is good and people are actually pulling this out of you, start doing other things to try to accelerate the growth. That's my general theory. And then the lessons that you get from 10 to 20 million are like, how do you, you know, put a company, how, how do you create a, machine of people that builds itself and deals with people problems that's really it right it's a totally different deal than you, you know you about the team? like not what's that you talk about your team yeah like you know when you have 50 employees like one day one day per week of everyone's week is internal communication and just making sure that there's alignment when you have so we had we had six people 14 months ago, maybe one hour a week was spent on that, right? And everybody's just jamming. You're constantly sort of texting each other or whatever. Communication is not a problem. When you have 50 people, there is so much that needs to go into alignment and reporting and making sure that like, 
there's understanding between what people at the top think should be done and you know what the sort of lieutenants who are people are executing for them what they interpret that is and then making sure that the right tasks are being done by people like it, the most important thing is not product anymore like our product's great like you know what i mean it's it's like very little iteration is happening at this point it's all figuring out how to remove or make these people that we have more efficient in executing this vision that we have totally different than zero to one you know it's the toughest part i think right uh, company culture aligning uh, core not only core values but hiring the right well, people. well yeah once you once what you get sense? to that once you get to that point where you got a bunch of people that becomes the whole challenge you know um but before that it's not a challenge at all because you just you know like we've been working together for like eight years before we started this the the five people that we're working on or whatever so so yeah um you know there's lessons at every stage you know yeah that are way different than the last set of lessons yeah a few things that got my attention uh yeah you we discussed with many uh, guests, and one of them was uh, Jeremiah Prammer at No Commerce. He said he, it was the fifth uh, company he started, or something like that. And we started a thread on, on 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 LinkedIn about that. And I remember many people saying, "Hey, my third, my fifth, my fourth, or whatever." Uh, in my case, I don't even count it anymore. But it's not the first. Uh, what what I did currently, and as he said, you learn a lot of stuff. And I think that it's that when you are an entrepreneur, you need to learn a lot of skills that are totally unrelated with the core offer, right? If you're starting retention, you, you, you don't need to know how to program or how to code or whatever. You need to know how to be a CEO in your case, right? How to have a team, how to grow a team, how to nurture them, how to uh, be for them and to have them aligned uh, towards the company goals, how to uh, pitch to investors and many, many other skills that we don't no, how to get on as many podcasts as humanly possible as yes. efficiently as possible, right? Exactly. Like... <laughs> exactly. So many, many, many skills, and then of course, uh, I think it was Alex Ramosi who said it, or at least I don't know if um, he was the first to say, it, but at least I read it from him. Like something like uh, expert um, experienced uh, business people uh, don't ever skip the basics. And it's something related to what you said. Uh, you still uh, keep in mind today the lessons from your first ventures and from where you were doing less than 1 million. And I think that um, it's something that was uh, really valuable to me, really valuable advice. And um, yeah, everything you said, I think that is that is great. And I love uh, reading everything that you post uh, really on, on LinkedIn. Uh, because when companies like, like yours build in public uh, and not telling always what worked for them but also what didn't work and what they are not currently happy with what they could improve um that that also shows that these companies are not perfect and they have still things to figure out and that's a humbling lesson for every other entrepreneur reading that as well yeah i think that um people want to know I think they want to know what you're doing that's working, but I think there's some connection that occurs when you're talking about what blew up in your face that is like a different kind. It's like an emotion. It's like, it just makes you feel good to know that others are in this unique type of pain that you are in, you know, as a founder, right? And I think my content does well because I articulate that type of pain very clearly. Yes. I totally agree. And I don't see a lot of other people really focused on it. I'm like very focused on trying to communicate the good and the bad of what it is like to be right here, right now today with, you know, I, I try to describe the circumstances. Well, like, look, this is where I'm at. This is the amount of people I have. This is what our goals are. <laughs> you know, and then be like, okay, here are the eight things that I fucked up this year, right? The the thing that, or the whole journey, right? Or like, you know, here's once a month, I'll be like, things I'm proud of, things I'm not proud of, you know, 
things I think are the things I'm most excited about for the future or whatever. Um, and yeah, I mean, people seem to love it. So. Yeah. I, I, I actually follow some, uh, like, uh, some people who build in public and they are great. Who are, who are they? Uh, well, uh, Ronak Shah at Obi. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. He's the man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I he was here in the podcast too, and then Greg yeah. and Chris Mead uh, at Crossnet, they were here yep. too. Yep, love About, those guys. Uh, They're uh, like our guys. Yeah, yeah. First I mean, body. No surprise, we get along, to, you know, pretty well. Yeah, so uh, the, the the all those guys build in public, and it's great because you actually get to learn not only when speaking with them, but also when um, well, chew on these podcasts uh, with uh, the guys on. Uh, at uh, OB is great. Uh, they deliver valuable lessons as well. And you have your thing too. You have your podcast. You have like uh, the um, some kind of um, what is the newsletter on LinkedIn? Yeah. So I I am making a docu series called Building Dollar Challenge. It's a ten minute Netflix style episode. There's ten episodes out of season one. Season two dropped on Tuesday. So check it out. People tell me it's very high quality. They're expecting crap. And it's like, it's actually like the the lifestyle of being in the middle of all of this as it's, you know, roller coastering all around me and like juggling, you know, family life. I have a 13 year old. I'm trying to stay healthy. You know, I'm on the road too much for all this crap. And, you know, it's it's just, it's trying to be a very honest portrayal of what it's like. And the girl who's doing it is, I think, doing a fantastic job at like, carving out story arcs you know i have a guy who follows me when i travel with a camera gary v style and then you know i do one interview a week with her and then she's able to basically formulate these story arcs um so that was my attempt at like a really unique p p uh, series of content that like what my problem was like b2b it's easy for me to create content that i feel like I'm the right person to deliver the message because it's fucking happening to me. You know what I mean? It's like, I can talk about downsizing a sales force and not seeing my pipeline change because of the screwed up situation that exists in the BDR landscape today, because everyone's spamming and they solve problem of lower results by spamming more. Like I can say that because I did it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like trying, when I originally started creating founder brand content, I just, it's like, People were like, oh, yeah, you know, 40% of it should be like this subject matter, you know. I'm like, I've never sent a direct consumer email. Like, why would somebody listen to me about any of that, right? Like, if I was Ron Shaw, <laughs> I think that they would, <laughs> right? But like, I'm a SaaS guy. So then I just started, I'm like, I don't know if D2C e is going to care about this or not. I'm just going to start talking a lot about my own business. And it was okay. And that show, I think, did pretty well. Like, mainly, it was, like, more impactful with the ecosystem than the actual brands. But that's important, too. All the agencies need to know who you are and, you know, the influencers and stuff like that, right? Um, but then I started, you know, since we have this B2B product, I started talking about sales, which, like, A, on LinkedIn, every single salesperson does their entire job there. And they're all feeling this pain. And then I'm actually the right person to deliver the message because it's happening to me, you know? So like, there's something interesting about author platform audience fit in the same way that this product market fit exists. Um, and that's what, you know, that's sort of why my content tends to skew towards building in public before the sales thing. I thought it was the only thing that I had to offer that was maximum authenticity that I could be radically transparent enough to where people would be shocked by how transparent it was. And D2C guys would still kind of care because they're also entrepreneurs, right? Like, and, and maybe they aspire to have a SaaS business at some point. I think a lot of them do, right? Like it's, everybody knows shipping software is easier than shipping a fucking college and thing like those obvious guys do, right? Yeah. Like well, that, uh, briefly, I don't want to... Um spend uh, i don't want you to spend a lot on this just briefly if you want i recently read i think it was from ron shaw you mentioned uh sass and i remembered uh, he said something like you know agencies many agencies and many brands are not having a great 
year. Some are, some are not. It's really tough for agencies to, um, I think many brands have been burned with bad agencies or things are harder for them and agencies need to transform. And he had an interest an interesting ideas, which was like something like SaaS companies should be, or th there should be a company offering both uh, like SaaS uh, services or uh, like in the form of, of a SaaS company plus being an agency. I don't know if it was clear or if I confused you more. Yeah, no, that was, that's perfect. SaaS with a that? heavily, heavy managed service. Yeah. Component. Like SaaS think, plus so, agency. Oh, yeah. So like, I think the higher priced SaaS and the larger the companies you sell into, the more that it yields itself towards having a significant managed service part of your business. I mean, the the it's it's like there's just a lot of problems with it as you deal with smaller and smaller businesses. You know, um, th there's a company that's an indirect competitor of ours of ours called Wonderkind. They don't really sell in Shopify anymore. It's like they're selling mid-market and enterprise, but they are that. They do this abandoned car audience expansion, but they actually do the creative on the flows as well. So they say, we're going to improve your conversion rate. And they get in there and they just, you know, they butcher it. They like 30% discount or whatever. So, um, you know, it's a novel idea. I would never do it personally in the Shopify ecosystem. Um, it just feels too small. It's like, I think the agency service becomes much more valuable when your company is so big, you can't get anything done internally. And then like, you're not really worried about like, you know, paying a hundred grand for something or whatever. It's like this combination of sort of price sensitivity and, you know, these software guys are still kind of do it yourselfers a little bit. And I don't know. It, wor it, it worries me. It worries me in this part of the market. I would never do it. Um, and uh, you, you don't get the same multiple on your revenue or EBITDA or whatever. Obviously, it's not software. It's like, it's a whole, it's a hard game to play. Um, you know? Well, this, this was great. I uh, got a, a ton of value and I'm sure the audience did too. Uh, and before you go, I wanted to ask you something. You know, for everyone listening or watching, you guys really know that we like, you know, getting book recommendations or uh sometimes it's uh you know people to follow uh so in this case do you have any books uh besides the one you already mentioned and you can always uh mention it again of course to recommend to the audience my two books i mentioned one of them before if it's software four steps to the epiphany by steve blank i think it's his name. and number two you mentioned the guy earlier Man, Alex Ramosi, I haven't read the new book yet, but like $100 million offers is amazing. I think approaching your product with this mindset that like, I want this to be so good that somebody would be stupid to not do it, who was like the right person to buy it. I think it's just an amazing starting point. And trying to like improve on that, you know, strength of offer. Um, yeah. Those are my two. That, that's great. I didn't read the first one. I did read the the second one and I read- A million that. leads? Yeah, and I read the second one too. Uh, I mean, a hundred million leads and the offers, like the first one too. Yeah. Uh, and I think that it, it, it forces you to stretch your mind in different directions, you yeah. know, yeah. to think about how you would structure offers and your services and products if it was- for only one client ever and the other way around if it was for like many many clients uh the different solutions one to many one one to one and and and, and uh, it's just um i don't know I, I follow his content a lot the value equation there are many many um elements that help me at least personally to better understand why i do third certain things and how to better structure others so it's a great one to recommend to the audience so thank you yep awesome, awesome. <laughs> so where can people go to learn more about you and retention i'm doing most of my stuff on linkedin right now um retention adam is my handle 
you can type in Adam Robinson retention.com. You will see a lot of stuff happening there. You can watch my show there. It's in my featured posts. I post three times a week. Um, and man, they're getting like thousands of engagements. It's crazy. It's just nuts. Uh, my website, the core company is called retention.com. You can check it out there. If you want to email me, adam at retention.com. I'm happy to, you know, chat about whatever. Awesome. So uh, for everyone listening or watching, unless you are already there, make sure to go to the dtcinsider.com, find the episode, and there you will find uh, all the resources that Adam mentioned, including the books, uh, his handle, and the the link to the, how do you call it, the docu-series on, on LinkedIn? Yeah, uh, you can link it there. It's also on YouTube. I have a retention Adam channel on YouTube. You can watch it there. Awesome. It's pretty good. I mean, it's worth it's worth just checking out if you're awesome. curious about what it what it's like to really scale a tech startup. Awesome. I'll from check when it you out. decide to do it till when you you know whatever. Adam, thank you again for being here. I I had a a really good time uh, chatting with you. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on, Brian. This episode was brought to you by BSR Digital. We help DTC brands grow through paid ads and email marketing campaigns. If you'd like us to help your business grow, head on over to bsrdigital.com and schedule a call with us.